Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Mercer's November investment webinar, actually our final investment webinar for 2020. Uh, I first wanted to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands on which we meet in Australia this afternoon and paying our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Also, kia ora to our very loyal audience from New Zealand. We're glad you've been able to join us again this afternoon. Um, I'm going to just run through quickly our agenda for today. Um, and we've got a good one, I think, to round out the year. So firstly, we do have uh, Simon Eagleton, who's the Institutional Wealth Leader for Mercer in the Pacific, uh, joining us shortly just to give a couple of reflections on the year um, and, and a bit of a year-end message for, for our clients. Uh, and then we have a very special guest joining us all the way from the US, Anthony Brown, who's our US Director of Capital Markets. And Anthony is going to give us a bit of um, on the ground perspective, if you like, around the, the US election and markets in general. And we've also got Guion Moore, our head of investment strategy, who many of you uh, may be familiar with from earlier webinars over the course um, of, of this year. He's, he's been a regular participant. Um, so we're going to uh, start off with a bit of a discussion, firstly, around uh, the US election and its implications, um, but then we're going to take a little bit of a, a uh, choose your own adventure, and we'd really like to focus on topics that are of most interest to you today. So we're going to give you the opportunity to uh, vote on, on the topics that we'll, we'll cover off through the rest of the session. Uh, we will leave some time for open Q&A at the end, so make sure that you are popping any questions in through the Q&A function within Zoom. You can do this at any time. And indeed, if a, if a topic that you vote for doesn't make it to the top of the list, um, I would encourage you still to put it in the Q&A and we'll try and get to it uh, at the end. Just a couple of housekeeping matters. We, we're not going to have any of these monthly webinars in the first quarter of next year. Um, but even better than that, we have our Mercer Global Investment Forum. It'll be an Asia-Pac forum uh, held virtually in the first week of March next year. And so we'd love you to, to join us for, for the Global Investment Forum if you're able to. Um, you will get a post-webinar survey as you exit this webinar today. So it'd be, we'd really appreciate it if you took um, just a couple of minutes to respond to the survey. Uh, and there will be a post webinar email that comes out probably early next week. Uh, and it will just provide you with um, some of the key takeaways from the session today, um, a, a paper that will give you a bit more information about how we're thinking about the US election and its implications, uh, and also some information there about the Global Investment Forum. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to Simon Eagleton. Thanks, Simon. Hi everyone, thanks Kylie, and I'm very pleased to crash your webinar today. I'll only say a few, stay a few moments, but I did want to just reflect on, you know, what a tumultuous year we've had. And it's one where there's been so few opportunities to connect with our clients face to face. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we've all felt the, um, the gap that that's, that that's created. So since it is our last session for the year, I did want to make sure that I thanked all our clients for their business this year and your partnership with us. I do hope we've helped you uh, navigate the tumultuous times that we've experienced over the last 12 months. I think it was one that clearly rewarded, um, let's say, intestinal fortitude. Um, it rewarded diversification um, for, for sure. Um, but look, I do, and on behalf of the whole leadership team at Mercer in the Pacific, I do want to thank you uh, for your business uh, and to wish you and your families a very safe and happy Christmas, such that it is, and hopefully at least within the, the two countries that many of us are sitting in now, um, maybe we have a chance to spend time with, with family if they're not in your hometowns. Um, and of course, wishing you all every success for next year, whether that's personal business or, or your investment programs, and we look forward to continuing to help you uh, next year. That's all I wanted to say, Kylie, so I will hand back to you and um, I'll enjoy the rest of the webinar. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Simon. It's lovely to have you join us this afternoon. Uh, so we'll ask Anthony and Guion, our panellists for today, to 
to join us. Uh, hi guys, good afternoon. Uh, and thank you particularly Anthony for, for joining us uh, from a very different uh, time zone. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, having, having you here today. Um, so the first question is actually gonna go to you, Anthony, and we do follow uh, the US quite closely and we've certainly followed the US election quite closely down here in the, the Pacific. So, you know, we're, we're, we're well aware that it's looking, you know, almost certain, I think at this point that Joe Biden will be the next president of the United States. Um, we're pretty aware that it's looking like the Senate may be most likely held by the Republicans. So we might have a, a split uh, between the House and the Senate. Um, so just, I guess, putting those two things in context for us, what does that really mean for, for, for markets um, in terms of the implications from that election result? Well, uh, thanks for having me today and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I mean, I mean, first off, the markets do seem pretty happy with the outcome so far. I mean, markets have gone straight up since the election. Um, I think part of that was just because there was a lot of nervousness that there, there, that the outcome wouldn't be known quickly, and and it, and it was pretty clear from the day after that Biden was going to be the victor. Uh, but I think probably more importantly, the vaccine news has has really taken over from the election. Um, but I mean, if if we look out over the next couple of years, I, I do think the election outcome was pretty benign for the economy and for markets. On the political front, we probably are in for a couple of years of gridlock. I mean, the, the Democrats do have a chance of, of capturing the Senate if they can win both of these uh, special uh, runoff elections in Georgia on January 5th. Right now, the betting markets give them about a one in four, one in five chance of doing that. So possible, but not likely. Um, but given if, if Republicans do uh, keep the Senate, it's going to be very hard for um, President-elect Biden to get much done on the domestic front. Um, now, ordinarily, that's not a bad thing for markets. I mean, I think the, the market often likes gridlock because it means we're not going to have extreme policies in either direction. The caveat this time is COVID. I mean, we, we do still need fiscal support in the U.S. Um, and, of the, and of the different potential election outcomes, this was probably the worst for potential uh, fiscal support. Uh, Trump probably would have been able to get more through the Republican Senate than Biden will be able to. Um, and, and, and so again, I think the US economy does need, still need the support. And we, we're, GDP is only 3% below where it was at the start of the year, but that really conceals a lot of pain underneath the economy. Um, this, has, this recession has fallen disproportionately on lower income households and small businesses. And they're the ones that need the support. Um, with a democratic sweep, we might have gotten two to three trillion of, of fiscal stimulus in the U.S. That's about 10 to 15 percent of U.S. GDP. Uh, Senate Republicans passed a half a trillion dollar plan. Um, and so now it looks like we're going to get stimulus more in the neighborhood of the, the Senate plan. Maybe we get up to a trillion, um, but certainly far less than the two to three trillion we would have gotten from a democratic sweep. Um, so ultimately, we'll, we'll likely get something, especially with COVID cases going up, it's going to be far less and probably significantly, it's going to take at least two to three more months, which is a shame because unemployment benefits are running out in a number of states. So people that lost their jobs on the front end of this are losing their benefits over the next few weeks. Um, so now the, so the big risk with this gridlock we're going to face in over the couple of years is is that uh, fiscal stimulus or fiscal support could be withdrawn too quickly, like it was after the GFC, so which could extend the recovery. But I think the risk of that has been lessened by this vaccine news, that if, if we can get good vaccines uh, widely available in late second quarter, early third quarter, that should, uh, that should take over from the fiscal stimulus. Um, now, I mean, looking beyond fiscal stimulus, I, I think there were some positives uh, from the election outcome. Uh, Biden had proposed partially reversing the 2017 corporate tax cuts and, and increasing income taxes on higher income households. And so there's no way that'll make it through a Republican Senate. So that's probably a positive from the market's perspective. And even if Democrats do pull off both of these special elections, he, Biden will have to dial, scale back his tax plans because it will only take one moderate Democrat to, uh, to, to kill it. Um, so that's a positive. And I also think that the trade uh, front should be a positive, at least relative to what it might have been if, if Trump was reelected. We should have a more multilateral approach uh, 
um, in negotiating with China rather than just relying on tariffs. And, and, and I think a risk of a second Trump administration would have been um, more hostility on trade towards the Eurozone. And so I know I think that's off the table. So overall, I mean, I think it's, it, yeah, it, it probably wasn't the best case outcome for markets, the election outcome, but it's, it's probably in neutral to, to slightly positive. Thanks, thanks, Anthony, for that. So, Gwen, I'm going to come to you now and just maybe if we can extrapolate that perhaps a little bit down to us in the Pacific in Australia and New Zealand. So, what does a Biden presidency mean for us uh, here in Australia and New Zealand? Yes, well, um, thank you very much, Carly. I thought that was very, very interesting, Anthony. Um, I think the, um, uh, there are really two aspects to this. The, um, the firstly is uh, how does it affect Australia and New Zealand in terms of their position in the world and their relationship to other countries? And then the second question is, how does it relate to Australian and New Zealand-based investors? Um, so as Anthony said earlier, the prospect is that we'll end up with a divided government in the US, um, perhaps, um, probably gridlock um, on the domestic front, which brings the focus more onto that international side onto foreign relations where the presidency has uh, a lot more freedom of action. Um, now, as Anthony said, we would um, expect the Biden presidency to have more of a multilateral focus, um, especially on the issues such as foreign policy, international cooperation, trade. Um, and from Australia's perspective, that may well in fact uh, result in some ways a bit of a demotion about where we're placed relative to the US and maybe a promotion for New Zealand. Um, under the um, Trump presidency, of course, they took a very, uh, the US government took a very unilateral approach to the world and didn't have a lot of friends internationally. Um, given that Australia had a conservative government that was more closely aligned with the Trump presidency, Australia was one of, the, as it were, the US's best friends in many ways on many issues. Um, whereas now we're likely to be part of a, um, a more broader Western alignment. Um, and it's probably a good outcome. Um, I mean, it's better to have more friends than less friends, as it were. Um, I think the area, and, um, and Anthony's already alluded to this, that is most interesting is how relations with China play out. Um, Obviously, it's been quite a tense situation and Australia has been caught in the crossfire. We've seen issues such as uh, trade sanctions against some of Australian exports. In terms of their materiality, they've not been that material as yet. It's mostly been symbolic. Um, but we've also seen things such as most recently, uh, we had the, uh, what's that? I have to get the acronym right, uh, <laughs> regional comprehensive economic partnership, uh, which is a new trade agreement um, for essentially the Asian region. It now makes it the world's largest free trade zone and is in sign of the times in so far as China is in it, but the US is not in it. Uh, now, when Trump came to power, um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership had just been signed, uh, of which China was not a part, um, largely because of issues relating to state uh, enterprises um, and the ability of the government to subsidise state enterprises. There is a prospect that that will be reinvigorated again under the, um, under the Trump presidency. Uh, and I think that's um, uh, potentially quite optimistic for, um, for uh, uh, you know, Australia's exports, its integration with the rest of the world and, and so on. In terms of sort of unique impact on Australian capital markets, and New Zealand capital markets, I think at the moment it, it's hard to identify something that would be um, uh, particularly either adverse or, or, or advantageous that is separate from the, um, the trajectory around trade. Um, and so I think that sort of uh, gives a, a, a summary of how we're thinking about the evolution over the next few years. Brilliant. Thanks, Gwion. Um, So what we're going to do now is because we, we really do want to make sure that we're touching on topics that are most important to our audience or of most interest. So we're going to just launch a poll and, and give you a few options. Now, some of these topic options are uh, an ability to drill down into some of the the uh, topics that have already been mentioned by Anthony and Guion, some of them are broader in nature. And what we're asking you to do is really to choose your top three from this list of 
10 topics. So we've got uh, US domestic outlook, we've got US China relations, US Australia relations, uh, growth stocks and, and tech, uh, central bank policy, credit markets, sustainability, foreign exchange, inflation, and major risks to growth. Um, so we're gonna give you just a minute or two to make your selections there. We'll wait for the results to come through. Great, okay, there's our results there. So I think that we have the, the winner being major risks to growth. I think that's a great topic. Uh, followed by uh, growth stocks and US-China relations, which have came in, come in at a tie for second. So we'll, we'll go there first. Um, but like I said, if you wanna drill into some of these other topics, um, please put them in the Q&A and we, we will try to get to them uh, uh, in the open Q&A session. Um, so let, let's start with the, the, um, the one that's got the most votes there and I'll get a perspective actually from both of you, maybe Anthony, I'll come to you first and, and perhaps, you know, doing it a little bit from a, from a US perspective, but also um, global. How would you be seeing the biggest risk to growth from here? Well, I mean, I mean, I think over the short term, I mean, there there are still the the risk from COVID. But if we take a step back and look more towards the intermediate term, assuming we yeah we 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 get past this, um, I guess one thing I think we've been a little worried about looking out say two, three, four years is that inflation will start to increase. I mean, we we of course have had a lot of stimulus. It hasn't resulted in inflation yet because we have plenty of excess capacity in the economy, but. If, if we do continue to get stimulus um, and the economy does fully normalize, then that's when we could start to see inflationary pressures. And then that that's what could lead the, the interest rates to finally start selling off, especially on the long end of the yield curve. That's been, uh, low interest rates has been a, a big boon for the equity market. It, it has helped support valuations, push valuations higher. So if we start to see risks of inflation uh, get priced into markets, I think that's when equity valuations could start to get uh, some downward pressure. Again, it's probably not a concern over the next couple of years because we, I think we really need to work off this excess capacity. We have to get back to, uh, back to trend. But once we get to that point, well, this kindling that we <laughs> have out there finally lead to inflation. So that's one thing I think I, I'm watching. Yeah, it's a really good point. I think, Anthony, there seems to be a fair amount of um, consensus around low inflation for the, the, the very near term, but then a lot of dispersion around uh, views on inflation from, from there. Guion, can I just come across to you and maybe get a little bit of your perspective on mm. uh, biggest risks from here? Yeah, well, I think I think the points that uh, Anthony made are, are very valid. Um, of course, we have the, um, at least for the for the next couple of years, quite a, um, a low inflation outlook. Um, but as Anthony said, you know, capital markets are at the moment um, being supported by extraordinary fiscal policy and extraordinary monetary policy. Um, and there's always the potential for some kind of policy error, um, whether that be uh, you know, gridlock in the US means that the level of fiscal support is uh, undershoots expectations, um, or that there is a, a, a consensus too early withdrawal of, of fiscal support. And this is something that the RBA has, um, has warned about quite recently. And I think that's um, probably the, um, the, uh, the most easily categorizable um, of, of the risks. Of course, there's always ongoing geopolitical risks, you know, tensions all around the world. Um, Europe, in some ways, it'd be uh, <laughs> quite a nice reminisce to go back to being able to worry about um, the political situation in Europe. Um, and so I'll, I'll put those down as the um, as uh, the, the most immediate shorter term risks, policy error, and uh, some being blindsided by some geopolitical factor. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Guion. All right. So let's go to our next topic. Interesting one. So we've obviously seen a quite remarkable performance from the IT sector this year as you know this COVID period has really led to a massive fa or fast tracking of the digitization of our mm. lives. Um, so I, I guess the, the question here is really around you know what where to from here for I guess technology stocks um, but also that outperformance uh, continued outperformance of growth stocks 
um, in general. So, Anthony, do you want to uh, perhaps have a go? You've obviously got a lot. This is a big theme in the US market, mm -hmm. of course. So perhaps interesting to get your perspective on that one. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing we've had uh, vigorous debates internally on. Uh, um, but I mean, our big concern now is just the valuations are so high. I mean, I mean, these companies, these the big cap tech stocks, which have been driving the U.S. markets, fundamentally they've performed great. I mean, the sales, earnings. Uh, I mean, they've they've left the rest of the market in the dust over the last five years. But it's really been over the last couple of years now where most of the gains have been driven by valuation expansion rather than those fundamentals. And then the valuation expansion has certainly been influenced by falling interest rates. Um, I mean, and, I mean, we've seen that uh, it, falling interest rates tend to help growthier companies than they do value companies. Um, so yeah, I mean, fundamentally, it's, it's hard to argue against them, um, but it's just the valuations are so high now. I, I think it's getting, it's going to be tougher and tougher to, to justify them. I mean, I just pulled Apple up as trading at a, a 30 forward PE and its earnings really aren't growing that fast anymore. I mean, this is, and I think you could say a lot with these big cap tech stocks, their earnings have already gotten such to be such a large part of the S&P 500. I mean, the law of large numbers are kicking in where they just simply cannot grow faster than the market and the economy indefinitely. Mm -hmm. um, and so the concern now is that the market, that investors have bid these up so much that it's going to, they're almost, they're highly likely to underperform expectations. Uh, so taking the other side, then I think a lot of these value companies that have been left behind uh, should start to, to benefit um, as, as the economy reopens and with the vaccines coming online. So, I mean, again, this is something we're still uh, debating on internally, but my, my own personal opinion is that value is starting to, to look a lot more compelling. Um, and perhaps now we've seen the momentum finally shift in, in value's favor. But I, I think I probably could have been accused of saying that a couple of other times over the last couple of years. Yeah, okay, Thank, thanks, Anthony. Mm -hmm. It's certainly been a topic of much debate at an industry level as well as within. Mm -hmm. you know, so I might just um, give an extrapolation of that uh, question, Guion, because obviously mm -hmm. the, the technology stocks mm -hmm. um, not as well represented in the Australian market mm -hmm. as they are in the US. I mean, we've certainly had some, some stellar performance from stocks like Afterpay, but in general, the Australian market has lagged. Mm. Uh, the US and you know that's one of the big reconciling factors not not the mm. only one so maybe just sort of to, to extrapolate that theme a little bit but look at it in the context of you know our local market versus versus the US I mean do, do we see a closing of that that gap if some of these trends start to ease yeah so I think um, I think uh, I think it's quite widely recognized that the sort of the relative underperformance of almost all stock markets not just Australia and New Zealand but everywhere that's not the US um, has been a um, has been a result of the outperformance of these tech stocks relative to the rest of the economy. Um, now, as we, I mean, our Mercer, Mercer's uh, sort of uh, uh, economic outlook at the moment is that we're in a recovery stage of the economic cycle, and we hope to see a um, a broadening of the economic recovery, whereby uh, a lot of sectors that have been left behind so far start to pick up again. Um, so. You know, retail-focused stocks, um, uh, commodity-focused stocks, I think might be particularly of interest. Um, it's part of our DA process. We've taken quite a constructive view on um, global small caps. Um, and so that's really just the, as, as Anthony was saying, you know, uh, trees don't grow to the sky. Um, the, um, uh, the tech stocks have got so big now um, that it's, um, it would be hard to imagine them to continue to outperform the market and as the recovery starts to develop, we should see a, a um, sort of the rising tide um, uh, lifting all boats a little bit more than we have seen so far. And that would particularly affect you know, more regional economies like Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we've also seen quite a robust pickup in, um, in trade in the Asia Pacific region, and that should also be supportive. Okay, great. Thanks, Guion. Um, so the, I think the last one comes to you in terms of our top three topics, Anthony, because it's looking at what does US-China relations look like from here? Um, obviously, this is feeding into a change of presidency as well, which is likely to see a bit of a change of tone, at least uh, in, in those, um, you know, the, the, the relationship between the two countries. So interested in your perspective on that. Well, I mean, uh, China relations was one area where there wasn't a lot of, uh, I guess, debate in, during the election that both sides, both Democrats and Republicans, 
I think support getting tougher with China on kind of the perceived uh, unfair trade practices. Um, so I mean I think that the pressure will remain on um, on China and, and the Biden administration. But I mean as I mentioned earlier though it it will probably be less far less focused on tariffs and more on perhaps rejoining the the TPP and and and, and just just working with with. Um, the other eurozone and and other nations to try to cooperate to 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 um, to encourage China to reform some of these practices. So I mean I don't I don't think Biden's going to come in and, and take off all the tariffs that that Trump I think he wants to use that as a negotiating tactic. Um, but I wouldn't expect him to start putting a lot more on. Um, and 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 overall I think the, I think the thing that the market will like is that his policies will be a lot more predictable, more transparent on on how he arrives at the decisions rather than um, an early morning tweet. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. Now I'm going to ask people um, if you do have questions for our panelists today or want to pick up one of the other topics that was on the list, please uh, pop them into the Q&A function within Zoom. Um, I can see we don't have any there at the moment. So I might just go while we're doing that, uh, while people are popping in their questions to uh, I think one of the other the topics that got a, a reasonable amount of the votes. Um, and I know it's it's been a big, big area of focus for us at Mercer over the course of the year, and it's around uh, credit markets, uh, how we're feeling on credit this year. We have obviously had a massive um, push out in spreads earlier in the year around the crisis period, and then we've had uh, spreads come in quite a bit since since then. Um, so maybe, Guion, if you don't mind just spending a couple of um, minutes on mm. perhaps how we're feeling about credit markets from here, what's, what's the role within a portfolio, um, particularly given where, where interest rates and bond yields are? Mm. Yeah, so the um, the performance of especially um, uh, corporate credit uh, since the um, you know the, the depths of the crisis has really been quite extraordinary. So we've seen um, uh, high yield spreads in the US come out down from over a thousand basis points to just over four hundred basis points today. Um, similarly, we've seen um, uh, investment grade credit spreads are pretty much in the US are pretty much back to where uh, they were before the onset of the crisis. And in Australia, at least looking at uh, you know the, um, the the Barclays Credit Index, um, credit spreads are actually tighter than they were before the onset of the crisis. Uh, so that's an extraordinary performance. Um, we were fortunate enough in the process to um, to take to at least to some degree take advantage of that, and we've been reviewing our outlook over the course of the past few weeks. Um, and Still constructive on credit. What we are doing is we're starting to look at new sectors, um, given that so much juice has come out of the corporate credit market. Uh, so we've been particularly looking at things like um, uh, emerging market debt, particularly local currency debt, uh, where the FX component um, has been uh, helping returns push along. Uh, similarly, we're looking at things like um, structured credit and private debt as well. And this, I think, is part of a general theme as the um, as the recovery starts to gather steam. Um, people will be working, as it were, down the risk spectrum, um, looking for yield that um, that is uh, no longer available in the more conservative sectors. Um, and we hope to take opportunities there ourselves. Great, thanks, Guion. Um, we do have a number of questions coming through now, and so Anthony, I'll come back to you for uh, one of the first ones. So. Uh, it says, Anthony, we see reports of 200,000 new cases per day in the US. As someone on the ground there, could you please provide your insights as to how these new case levels impact the morale and sentiment of the US consumer? Well, I mean, I, 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 mean, I think it's going to have a pretty significant impact over the next few months. Um, I mean, we, we have had... Uh, some degree of restrictions put back on. I, I, I'm based in St. Louis, and I think it was as of last Tuesday or Wednesday, um, um, bars were forced to close and then no more uh, dining in. I mean, restaurants can still do takeout, um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, no more dining in. I think uh, that's happening in quite a few cities. Um, I mean, it's still, it's still nothing like what it was back in April. I mean, I think, um, I think, I mean, I think pe this is going to hurt spending over the short term, but there's not the same fear there was back in the, in April, because I mean, I think we, we do know a lot more about the virus and, and, 
um, and and the death rates aren't as bad as initially feared. So, I mean, it is affecting sentiment, but it's not the, I say it's nothing like what, what it was in the spring. Um, and so I think probably a, a lot of people are going to kind of, uh, more and more people are going to stay in place over the next few months, and then and 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 then I wouldn't be surprised if it winds up being uh, if we have a slight contraction in GDP in the fourth quarter and into the first quarter. But then hopefully, um, w the the vaccine will become widely available enough that uh, that cases will start to decline. Okay, thanks, Anthony. Uh, Guion, I'm coming back to you because there's a couple mm. of questions here on the same topic, and it's around uh, foreign exchange, really uh, the mm. outlook for the Australian dollar versus the US dollar. Yeah, a question I wish I knew the answer to. Yeah. Um, so obviously the Australian dollar sold off very dramatically in the depths of the crisis and now has recovered quite sharply um, as the recovery has, um, has a set in, or at least recovery in capital markets itself. Um, when you look at things like valuation metrics, uh, real effective exchange rate, uh, purchasing price parity, et cetera, where, you know, maybe a little bit overvalued, but it's really, you know, within bounds of error. So it's hard to say, you're probably better to say fair valued. Um, I think it's fair to say that the story across FX markets overall over recent months has been one of um, the US dollar declining against all currencies. Um, and that's just a reflection of greater confidence in the strength of the recovery um, as you know, US dollar or, and US assets are essentially, especially treasuries are essentially the risk off asset in the crisis. As that has been withdrawn, US dollar has declined all currencies pretty much have risen. Um, we don't have a strong view internally at the moment, but if I had to, if I had to make a bet, I would probably favor ever so slightly appreciation for the Australian dollar. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Guion. Um, there's a question here, and I think it's 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 climate related, um, but it's also really linked to the the change of presidency in in the US. So, Anthony, I'm wondering if you're happy to give a couple of comments on it. Um, so, what's the direction of travel on climate? Will uh, Biden be able to do more domestically, uh, and presumably the US will uh, rejoin the Paris uh, Accord? What are the market impacts of that? I mean, it's, I, mean, I, I think, yeah, we will rejoin the Paris Accord, but I mean, I think it's going to be hard for Biden to do much domestically with a Republican Senate. Um, I and mean, part of his proposal was to spend around two trillion on kind of infrastructure and um, green energy in investments. Um, and so that certainly isn't going to happen with the Republican Senate. Maybe there's a chance he could persuade a, a Republican or two to come over uh, for for some part of this, but it, we're not going to see anything like the two trillion he was hoping for. So, I mean, we probably we're not going to see anything transformational coming over the next couple of years unless Democrats do pull off the upset. Now, he can do some stuff on the regulatory front. One thing Trump did was relax quite a few environmental regulations, um, and so Biden can. <laughs> Biden will presumably reverse those. So, yeah, so there's some stuff he can do on, on just from executive orders and on the regulatory side, but but it'll be pretty limited in scope. Yeah, okay. And I might just add to that maybe just a bit of a broader perspective, because obviously it is quite different as you move around the the regions. And so from a sort of a, a regulatory and, and climate action standpoint, particularly in Europe, um, you know, we're certainly seeing a lot of activity there we are, you know, 10 years since the Paris Agreement was first set and probably not a lot of progress towards the goals at a global level. Um, but the UN, you know, is, is terming this ne next decade, the decade of delivery. And we are seeing more governments, whether they be state governments, such as in Australia or federal governments, uh, say in New Zealand, and certainly um, in, in the Eurozone making uh, firmer commitments to uh, net zero by 2050 and indeed a lot of large corporates around the world. So there is quite a lot of momentum, I think, at a global level that, um, you know, will play its way out in markets as we focus on that uh, transition to a lower car carbon economy over the next uh, decade and decade and beyond. Um, so coming back to the list of questions, Guiana, I might come back to you. There's a, there's a question here around our views on uh, 
private markets um, and just mm -hmm. ask, asking for, um, so outlook for private markets and how does this differ to small caps? So there's sort of a listed versus unlisted question in there as well. Yeah, so let me, let me just have a, a little moment to think. The, um, we went through a period of extreme risk aversion um, and effectively monopolization within the economy. Um, we also had a radical transformation in the way we behave um, as well. And that means that there's effectively now um, a opportunity for a prolonged period of what you might call innovation and restructuring within the economy. Um, for example, you know, our cities in some ways need to change to respond to the fact that so many of us are working from home. Um, uh, our office spaces need to be rebuilt. Um, our retail needs to be reconceived. Uh, these are opportunities that are more likely to be taken up within the private sector, I expect. Um, and so I personally, particularly things like private equity, foresee um, quite a few new opportunities as we start to embrace this as the new world post, um, post pandemic. Okay, great. Now we might just do one more question um, because before we finish up the webinar today, we also just want to get a sense of uh, what people would like to hear from mm -hmm. us in, as we move into to next year. So um, just one of the final questions to pick up on here, and I might come back to you, Anthony. So it's saying, are you bullish or bearish on the US 10 year uh, treasury in the short term? Well, I mean, probably over the short term, we're, I would we're probably in, uh, neutral to, to slightly bearish. I mean, think, I mean, we we could we've already seen yields back up a bit on the vaccine news. They could go a bit higher from here, um, but I do think if they start to move too much higher, then the Fed would step in and, and start to jawbone them lower. And if it and if if they went up even further, then that's where we could still we could see more um, talk of yield curve control. So um, yeah, so probably I, I I would my guess is that tr treasury yields are in a trading range over the 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 short term, um, and now in our in our uh, dynamic asset allocation reviews, we do have a slight negative bias on duration, and we have recently moved to an underweight on defensive fixed income. But that underweight is more driven by um, the need for a funding source to go more overweight to risky assets mm -hmm. rather than being outright bearish on, on duration. Right. Thanks, Anthony. All right. So we just want to do something a little bit fun, if you just bear with us. Um, we're going to launch a word cloud, if anyone has done these before. Um, yeah. Um, so what, what we're just going to ask you to, to do is, I think I'm going to the chat function, I think, and there's if you go into the chat function, there is a link there that says menti.com. Um, if you go in there, you'll have the opportunity to just, we're asking you just to type a word or a short phrase or maybe a couple of words on what's the topics that you'd most like to hear about at our events as, we, as we're thinking about our planning into to 2021. Okay, just so just for anyone who hasn't managed to find it, if you go into the chat function, you'll see a link there, menti.com. We're starting to get some results come in now. All right, private markets it's in the lead at the moment. Okay, so I can see some people are putting their responses into the chat function. If you can just click, if you look up in the chat function, you'll see a link there that says menti.com. If you click on the link and then put your response in. All right, so private markets is still winning. Climate, okay, it's taken over, that's a good one. So this is very helpful for us because not only does it help plan our webinars in 2021, we are also planning for the Global Investment Forum in March. So we'll very much take this input into consideration as, we're, as we make our plans around that. 
Okay, so we look like we're getting, oops, still moving around there. Okay, so climate's still up there in the lead, followed, I think, by what looks to be a pretty close tie between private markets, maybe just in second. Uh, private debt and real estate. So yeah, I, I think we'll take that as a final result. Thank you, we'll capture that and actually we'll send that out to you, I think in the, um, in the, in the post webinar email as well. So um, I wanna say a massive thank you to our panelists today, Anthony for joining us uh, from, from the States and Guion, um, you've been a regular participant over the course of the year. So thank you for, for all of your participation in the, in the many webinars. I know that it will have been much appreciated. Um, just to echo uh, Simon's sentiments early to, to thank you, not only for your participation in the webinars, but um, for your partnership with us over the course of the year. Uh, we are nearly done with 2020. It's been an extraordinary year, I think, in, in so many ways. Um, but we hope that you managed to get a really good break in. We're in such a good place, I think, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, Australians, I think, now most able to, tra able, to, able to travel for Christmas over throughout most of the country, which I think is, is, is a really terrific uh, place to be. Um, but have a, have a very Merry Christmas. And we look forward to seeing you uh, in 2021 at one of our events and hopefully at the Global Investment Forum. Thank you very much, everybody.